Hey guys, welcome back once again to our video lecture series. This video introduces boundary value problems for partial differential equations. We have shown in past examples that second order linear PDEs can have infinite families of solutions, each with different forms and containing different free parameters. When applying these equations to model a physical system, we would like the resulting solution of our model to be unique. Otherwise, it would be impossible to apply this result for physical prediction or engineering design. When solving a PDE in a physical context, we can specify a unique member of an infinite class of solutions by specifying auxiliary conditions that our solutions must satisfy on the boundary of its spatiotemporal domain. Consider this meme. The barber asks the guy what kind of haircut he wants. The guy responds with a hyperbolic PDE with two auxiliary conditions. The PDE itself has infinitely many solutions. However, given the conditions on the function f and its derivative, the solution is specified. The barber knows what haircut to give the guy only because of the auxiliary conditions at x equals y. Similarly, Oliver Heaviside specifies his preferred haircut by invoking his famous step function. Say no more, fam. Before specifying the types of boundary conditions we will see when exploring PDEs, it is useful to review the possibilities for domains and their specific boundaries. For differential equations with one independent variable, or ODEs, the domain of the solution is a subset of the real number line, shown in blue. If the domain is bounded on both sides, its boundaries are specified by two points, shown in red. Therefore, boundary conditions for ODEs are specified at single points. For a PDE with two independent variables, the domain will be some planar subset of the two-dimensional real numbers, R2. In theory, the domain could be specified as any planar shape. The blue square and circular areas shown here are just two examples. The boundary of this domain will therefore be some curve in the plane, shown here in red. For PDEs with three independent variables, the problem domain will be some subset of 3D space. The cube and the cylinder shown here are just two examples. The boundaries of these volumes will therefore be some surface oriented in 3D space. In these examples, the boundary of the cube is the surface made up of the combined planar faces, and the boundary of the cylinder is its two circular faces and the outer sleeve. It is mathematically possible to have PDEs with four or more independent variables. However, for obvious reasons, it becomes difficult to visualize the domains and their boundaries geometrically. Now that we have a clear idea of what the boundary of a domain of a PDE is, we consider some different types of boundary conditions. Given a differential equation in the domain, we can specify conditions at the boundary in the following ways. Conditions on the solution function u itself are called Dirichlet conditions. It is also common to prescribe conditions of the derivative of u in the direction normal to the boundary. This is notated here as partial u partial n. This type of condition is known as a Neumann condition. Finally, it is also common to see conditions on the weighted sum of the function u and its first partial derivative. These types of conditions are called Robin boundary conditions. It is also worth noting that there is some practical distinction to be made in the types of independent variables which appear in our PDEs. Cartesian spatial variables, often notated x, y, and z, are used to represent points in space. On the other hand, time-like variables, notated with a t, tend to represent unidirectional motion in time. There is, of course, no real mathematical difference in these variables, and any notation could be used in your equations. However, differential equations designed to model physical systems often have different terms relating to each type of variable, as we will see in the coming slides. Often, conditions on the boundary of a time domain are called initial conditions instead of boundary conditions, although there is, again, little mathematical distinction. Also, you may sometimes hear physical models called n-dimensional when they include n-spatial variables, even though their mathematical domain is n plus 1 dimensional, including spatial variables and a time variable. 
For example, the 2D Laplace equation and the 1D wave equation both have solutions with two independent variables. The Laplace equation models the steady state equilibrium of some field over some 2D planar spatial domain. It can have boundary conditions opposed on the spatial boundaries of this domain. The 1D wave equation is thought of to model a 1D spatial domain, like an infinitely thin guitar string, vibrating in time. It could have boundary conditions at the edges of its spatial domain, but conditions at the beginning of the time domain are called initial conditions. This carries over when adding more spatial dimensions. The 3D Laplace equation models an equilibrium state of a solid volume, while the 2D wave equation models time oscillation of a planar surface, like the vibration of a drum head. Finally, the 3D wave equation has four independent variables. It models the time propagation of waves in three-dimensional space. For example, the vibrations of any solid object in our universe. In this example, we will show how applying boundary conditions over some domain can be used to specify useful solutions from larger families of solutions. We found three general families of solutions of this PDE in our last lecture. Here, we specify a domain from 0 to L in the x variable, but let y vary over the whole real number line. We then specify boundary conditions that state that the solution function is 0 on the boundaries of the x domain, i.e., when x equals 0 and L. Our first family of solutions for our PDE were simple linear functions in x. Applying the boundary conditions, we see that they imply that both the free parameters are 0. In other words, the only function of this type which satisfies our boundary value problem is the trivial solution u equals 0. Our second family of solutions was exponential in both variables x and y. Since the exponential functions never take zero values for any x, the boundary conditions imply that both coefficients in this case are zero too. Hopefully our third case will yield a more interesting result. Our third family of functions finally yields non-trivial solutions of our boundary value problem. Since the sine term is equal to zero only when its argument is equal to n times pi, where n is the integer, we can solve for values of alpha which satisfy the boundary condition. This then leaves us with an infinite family of solutions with one free parameter, b3, which all solve our bvp. Note that the boundary conditions given here were not enough to specify a unique solution of the boundary value problem. A unique solution of this BVP could be found by specifying a further auxiliary condition, perhaps on the function or its derivatives at some location of the second variable y. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more mathematical content.